Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Career Cert for our webinar today. We are so grateful for this opportunity to connect with you. I'm your host for the webinar, Danielle. At Career Cert, we are focused on providing emergency and healthcare professionals with the training they need to best protect and care for their communities. And so we are grateful for this opportunity to connect with you. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter for this webinar, Travis Crime. Travis has 22 years of experience in emergency services. A majority of that experience was as a paramedic working in multiple environments ranging from urban to austere. He has also worked for and led a healthcare coalition and coordinated enterprise level emergency management. Travis works for the District of Columbia Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency as a training and exercise program manager. Travis is a certified emergency manager through the International Association of Emergency Managers and serves as a vice chair in the Government Affairs Committee. Travis holds a bachelor's in emergency management and a master's in management and leadership. And now I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you, Travis. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, welcome you from what is now sunny Washington, D.C. Earlier it was a little rainy and uh, windy, but I think we're, we're actually coming through that. Welcome to spring. Um, I'm excited that you chose to uh, spend your Saturday or your Friday afternoon with me. Um, and I hope that you leave today um, thinking about situational awareness and triage and the ICS process differently. Um, to get us there, our objectives for today um, should be pretty straightforward. We're actually going to talk about and look at um, some of the key decisions that we should be looking at um, and thinking about on every scene long before we ever get to incident command. We're going to discuss how to develop good proactive scene management skills through improved situational awareness. Um, we're gonna discuss simple triage specific habits um, that will help you manage a scene um, long before it gets complicated. We'll discuss the initial impact scene management um, is going to have on your ability to successfully transition from um, a normal scene to a functional incident command structure and then we'll review some of the basics of ICS specifically for a mass casualty incident. So um, early in my career, I heard one of my coworkers say this, and it's just kind of stuck with me. Um, one of the thing, one of two things will manage your seat, you or chaos. Um, either you're going to decide early on that this is um, within your control and you're going to set up uh, boundaries for what you can control um, and and make sure you're proactive in the things that you can control or you're going to go you're going to fly um, feet first into this not paying attention to what's going around you try to be the hero and end up walking away covered in chaos um, and we'll talk about what covered in chaos means and in, in a little bit also, I'll preface this with I'm from North Carolina, even though I'm in, in Washington, D.C. now. Um, so if my uh, accent gets a little Southern or I say y'all too many times, somebody throw up a hand and remind me. Um, and if you can't understand what I'm saying, it tends to happen even more when I'm presenting like this. So first question. Um, for you to think about um, yourselves, and we'll kind of talk through this a little bit. Is there a difference between incident command and scene management? I want you to think about what that means. Um, you know, you'll hear some folks in our industry say that incident management and scene management are the same thing. Well, they're not necessarily. Um, they have some ties that link them together, um, but every agency functions differently um, what every agency expects you to do um, while you're on the scene of anything from a medical call to a house fire changes um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction incident command is meant to be a universal incident management process that we're supposed to be able to apply to every scene 
but we all know that it doesn't happen every day, even if it should. Um, and that there are some agencies out there that actually still haven't adopted ICS as a uh, structure at all. That's a whole different band, or that's a whole different soapbox for me that we won't get into today. Um, but specifically scene management, when we're talking about scene management, we should all know that it's needed for every scene, whether there's one patient or a hundred, one vehicle into a tree, one house where the smoke detector is going off, one house that's on fire. Scene management is a pretty consistent concept. Um, and for us today, we're specifically going to be talking about um, and, and lumping um, scene safety, scene size up into our, our construct of scene management. And the thing that I want to make sure that, you know, if, if you don't take away anything from anything else from today's lecture, it's, it's to make sure that you need to slow down and think um, a little bit more critically, I guess, would be the, the best way to put this. Um, you know, especially talking to, to those of you in the audience that are um, a year or less or two years or less into this business, um, not everything is a hurt. We're not in a hurry for everything. Um, and for those of you that have been at this five or more, um, you, you've probably figured this out, but it's a reminder to don't get caught um, being complacent um, and for getting to pay attention to the world around you. Um, so again, for every scene, the things that we should do, and I, I hope we all know this by now, drive up slowly. There should be no um, pedal to the metal, fly up, throw it in park, and jump out. Emergency traffic near the scene, back at desk, slow down, ease into the scene, know what you're getting into, know what the actual layout is. Um, begin your scene survey long before you ever get there. Um, and then think about how you parked. Um, if, I have any law, if I have any law enforcement brethren on the line, please, for the love of everything holy, think about how you park. Uh, because how you park sets up the scene for everybody else that arrives behind you. Um, and if we all pull in nose first, bell out, um, and, and go running toward the scene, then those of us that come later end up three blocks back hiking it in, um, which creates delays in care um, and may uh, change how we need to leave. And that's what I, one of the other things, you know, the how you park is how you arrive affects how you leave. So make sure we're always thinking about that. And I hope. I hope, I hope that many of these things that I'm going to tell you today, you already know and that you're already practicing. But if not, those are those are some of the, if you don't take away anything else, take away those. So scene management um, will be the, the, the first part of this discussion. Um, and how many remember from your national registry days, uh, you know, scene safety, PPE, survey the scene, uh, and then you get into the number of patients and what kind of patients and you, you, you start doing the checklist approach. That's a great way as a beginner to start your process. Um, but I think we all know that, that it creates uh, some problems for us because if that's the only time you think about surveying your scene, you're setting yourself up for a lot of safety issues. Um, you're setting yourself up for trouble. You should be surveying your scene again and again and again, constantly, head on this level, making sure you're paying attention to the world around you. But again, in those first few moments when you get there, um, this is one of the things that I find the hardest to teach and explain and, and get my EMT students to understand is this is all of this that we're getting ready to talk about happens in the blink of an eye. Um, once this becomes a habit for you. Most of us don't think about this in a checklist approach anymore. We just take a visual snapshot of the scene with our eyes and we've probably answered most of these questions. Is the scene safe or not? Um, and what does scene safety really mean? And, and we'll get into my soapbox on that in just a moment. Can I 
see how many patients that I have. And I don't ask myself just on a meta or on a, a, a trauma call, how many patients do I have? I ask, let's say, if you know, I was dispatched to a medical, I'm, I'm walking into someone's house or an apartment. Um, I still ask myself, how many patients do I see? How many patients could I have? Um, are they sick or not? And again, most of us by now have figured out that we can learn a lot about the patient from when we first walk in the room and you know, do they make eye contact with us? Do we, you know, when we make eye contact with them, can we hear what they're saying? If they're talking, does it make sense? What does it tell me about their work of breathing? Um, what does it tell me about their mental status? What does their skin look like? What position? And all those things tell me, are they sick or not? Because I can tell about their respiratory status, their blood pressure, their mental status, um, and I can see whatever injuries they have. And that's all when I first walk in the room. Additionally, based off of what I've, the, the questions that I've, I've asked so far, you know, how many patients, is it safe or not? Are they sick or not? Do I have the right people there to help me? Um, am I an EMS crew and I've got a, um, a fire engine with me? I've got all the help that I need. Or um, do I see four or five people that could be patients um, and it's just me and it wasn't dispatched as a multi-vehicle, so I need to ask for more help? Um, and you know or do i need does do i need my help to come faster if help is already on the way uh, and the the other the other bullet point here that we sometimes forget to ask and sometimes we just assume is someone leading the fight if i'm not the first person there um if somebody got there before me i can't just assume that they went through all these steps too um, I need to verify that they're actually managing the scene, not just responding to the scene. So if they're just responded to the scene and um, they were having a bad day and they weren't thinking about what was going on and, and ran head first into the scene um, or feet first into the scene uh, and missed clues about something that's going on around, I can't just follow them in. I still need to assess what I'm seeing as I walk up and then I need to verify with them, hey, what do you have? What do you need me to do? Um, what can I do to help you best? And if they are neck deep in alligators and don't realize it, that may be your opportunity to um, begin managing the scene and say, okay, great, here, let me help you. You guys keep taking care of that patient. We're gonna, I'm gonna put my partner taking care of that patient. Um, and we're gonna start, we're gonna re-triage the scene. You know, whatever the situation is, you know, be, uh, be tactful about it, but at some point we've got to decide who's leading the fight because we can't, it can't be a free for all or we'll never get anything done. So, all of these things that we've talked about so far, all of these things should be, all of these steps should be done long before we ever say that we've identified somebody as the incident commander because these things should happen on every scene. So if it's your agency SOP to identify an incident commander for every scene, great. You're following a very um, structured and appropriate process. Most places don't do that. Um, and if it's a medical call, the paramedic's in charge. If it's a fire call, um, the fire captain is in charge. You, know, it, it, you go through that process and it's we have default leadership. Um, just by the way we naturally respond with each other every day. Um, don't take that default leadership for granted. Um, make sure that, again, back to this, that somebody's leading the fight and that the person that's leading the fight understands the totality of the situation around them, um, both for your safety and for the safety of your patients, the rest of your crew members, and the community around you. You don't want things to get worse and generate more patients. We've all been on those in this those scenes where, and there's one here on the, the screen, but it could be just a standard traffic accident. How, how many times do these standard one or two vehicle traffic accidents become pileups because of a distracted driver on the road? Who's watching to make sure this doesn't get worse? So just a, an example of um, how scene management is there, not just to take care of what you see in front of you, but also to prevent additional issues from occurring. So we're gonna start our first poll. 
Um, and, and this will set up one of my uh, soap boxes. Um, does teaching students to say scene safe PPE at the beginning of every scenario, um, uh, has it built a better culture of safety in our profession? Yes or no? Oh, I see the numbers, poll in progress. Going about 30 seconds now, about 70% of you have voted, swinging toward the yeses. All right, we're at 77% complete. The poll's been closed. We got 66% said yes, 34% said no. I, I, I'm gonna tell you, I fall into the no category. Um, I can appreciate those that voted yes, um, but here's why I say no. Because when we teach EMT students to walk up and say, scene safe PPE, they know that they're checking off a box on the National Registry Skills Sheet. Um, and then again, this is all, and it's all in how you teach it too. I will, I will give you that. Um, but when, What we have to make sure that they're doing is that they own that they don't just see scene safety as that one snapshot in time when we first arrive on scene. And that's where I think that's why I fall into the no on have we built better culture in our profession? Because what we've done is built a rote learning experience where they know that when they get to this point of the scenario, they do this. Um, so it's our job as, as leaders and as professionals to make sure that, that they carry that beyond just the check sheet and beyond just the scenario. Um, you know, and I, I tend to, to scare my students a little bit with uh, scene safety isn't just about, um, you know, is there something going to find my cursor? Uh-oh. Scene safety isn't just about something that um, is going to impact you before you or when you first arrive on scene. What's going to kill you and your partner before you arrive on scene? What could kill you or your partner before you get to the door, before you get to the car? What's going to kill you in the house? What's gonna kill you before you get back to the truck? What about on the way to the hospital? All of these phases um, are things that we need to think about. It's not just a hoop that we jump through um, in um, in a scenario, and that's why you know I when I'm starting to teach this for my EMT students, I don't teach scene safety. Um, I teach scene safety as part of situational awareness. Are you aware of what's going on in the world around you at every critical phase of the call, before, during, and after, and while you're off the call. Um, it's constant. It's knowing where your partner and the rest of your crew are. Do you know where the exits are? If you're in a building or if you're in someone's house, do you know how to get back out? Um, do you know, you know, are, are you making sure that there's no family member or anything blocking you from going back out the way you came? Do you know why grandma wants to go to the bedroom and get her purse? Does grandma want to go to the bedroom to get her purse or does grandma want to go to the bedroom and get the sawed off shotgun because she's tired of listening to you try to convince her to go to the hospital? Um, knowing what's going on in the world around you is important. What is your patient's body language telling you? Um, do they Are they telling you that they're uncomfortable with something? Are they telling you that they're anxious? Are they telling you that um, that they're in more distress than they say they are? Um, are they worried about something? And, and then there's also the the gut. There's the Gibbs. If for any of you that watch NCIS, and if I was wearing a hat today, oh, here to see my my NCIS hat. Um, you know, what does the Gibbs gut tell you? What doesn't feel right? Because if something doesn't feel right it probably isn't right. Um, you know, I, I have a war story here and I'll, I'll try to keep these limited. Um, 
before I moved to DC, I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina. I worked for um, Mecklenburg EMS Agency or Medic for a while. Good urban system. Um, most of the time I responded with the fire department, um, but you know, we on a, on a, what was supposed to be a, an alpha level call, they weren't coming with us. It was the middle of night in um, what was not a bad neighborhood, but you know, not a higher end neighborhood. And there wasn't a lot of details on the call. Um, and we pull into this cul-de-sac of apartments. Um, and all of a sudden it, you know, something you just, just didn't feel right. Um, there was nobody out there waiting for us. Um, it was the, the perfect um, opportunity to, to have blocked us in or to have caught us off guard. And I was like, hey, you know, need law enforcement. I don't, you know, something doesn't feel right. You know, my partner is a rookie. He didn't understand the feeling that was eating at my gut. And then I started pointing some things out to him I was seeing on the scene. They told us there was a party here and that the person was that there was a person sick at the party and there's no party at this address um, and the address is correct you know and uh, so it just didn't feel right come to find out there was somebody there that um that had a mental illness and we don't know for sure that he was trying to ambush us but he didn't he wasn't calling us there um for his benefit he was calling us there for nefarious purposes um, and, you know, I, I had no solid evidence of that other than something just didn't feel right based off the location and the things that we saw around us. So when in doubt, trust your gut. But again, all, you know, that's, that's a, and that's an example of, hey, you know, we're, we were assessing the scene on the way in. Um, but the same, I've, I've been in similar situations where we've gotten all the way into the house and something just didn't feel right in the house. You know whether it was a family member or the patient or something else in the situation and you know you at that point you've really got to decide do i need to stay here or do i need to get back outside um and and it's not seen safety that's the driver there it's your situational awareness telling you whether the situation is safe or not and so um always 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 be paying attention to what's going on in the world around you the other place that i will plug situational awareness um, is with this thing in your hand um, this is a non-ems example this is an everyday example how many of us walk out of target or mcdonald's or wherever with the phone in hand we're staring down at it walking texting looking around not paying attention to where we're going all of you raise your hand, we've all done it. Um, walking in the parking lot is, uh, we have just set ourselves up for failure by doing that because we're not paying attention to the situation around us. Um, and we've just made ourselves a target. Because we're walking toward our car. Um, there are multiple opportunities for people to be watching us, to be following us, or for them to be hiding in places in between cars for them to um, jump at us. We are not being very situationally aware. So again, don't just like distracted driving is an issue. Don't don't be on this and walking walking through the parking lot, especially by yourself, not paying attention to the world around you. Um, and you you can apply that same concept to just about any situation. Am I paying attention to what's going on in the world around me? Um, there was a situation from. Uh, I heard one of the survivors from Boulder this week talking about um, how he made it through that situation. Um, he was a former grocery store employee, not at that grocery store, but understood the layout of the grocery store um, and understood that as soon as he heard shots going off in the background, that he didn't need to go that way. Um, you know, like everybody else going toward the front of the store because that's where they assumed the exits were. He knew he was aware enough of his situation to grab people and start going to the back of the store. He knew that the loading dock was a way to get out of the building and started pushing people out that way with him. You know, he he thought about his prior, previous experiences um, in a similar setting, even though there might not have been gunshots in the previous uh, his previous setting. 
he knew that was a way out, not the front. So he paid attention to the world around him. How would you have responded to that situation? So um, again, situational awareness is a key component to scene management. We always need to be reassessing what's going on in the world around us, always continuing to think about um, is what I'm doing or is the situation that I'm in safe or not? Do I have more patients than I had when I started? How many of us have been on the call that you know we showed up for grandma, now we're doing CPR on grandma and grandpa? Um, or you know, one had a heart attack, now the other one's having a stroke. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, and again, continue to pay attention to uh, your resources, where they're coming from, what you need them to do. And that's, those are talking points for later. Um, so now um, we've had a couple of stories, but now we have a little bit more targeted focused story time with Travis. So we're gonna talk about um, a little vignette I call covered in chaos. So it's movie night. You've been working like crazy lately. Um, all of us are coming off, um, hopefully working hours and hours and hours and hours toward COVID and other things. And it's a well-deserved movie night. So you've got your popcorn ready, you've got the movie picked out, you've made your adult beverages, um, and you're ready to go. Just going to zone out and relax. And then your doorbell rings. I'm like, that's weird. And it's like eight o'clock. I'm not expecting anybody. Nobody ever comes to visit. They just call, text. Look, did you see that the other? It's like, did, did you order food? You're expecting a package? No, no I'll, I'll go see what it is. Yeah, you've already started the process of zoning out. You're not necessarily thinking. So you go to the door, open the door, you expect to, you know, your, your dog comes behind you, you expect to find, you know, it's a, you know, probably a prank, somebody just, you know, ring and run, or somebody's lost. You know, you ex just expect to be whatever you normally find when you open the door. Instead, you find, something on fire in front of you not what you had expected so we put a pause in your response right here and now it's time to think about how managing the situation or managing the scene matters how are you going to react or respond to this are you going to panic are you going to fall on instinct or your training, prior experience? What is going to be your next reaction? Well, let's say you took the panic reaction. Because again, you're not at work. You aren't thinking. Fire, bad, put it out. Got to go back and watch the movie. Well, instead, you fell for the trick. Um, and then you fire emergency i got to do something um your fight or flight res, uh, response kicked in you stumped and stomped all over the bag we all know what was in the bag didn't smell nice it's extra squishy that night um, and your movie night is ruined and you are now covered in chaos okay so cover in chaos when i say covered in chaos this is what i mean because we don't want to say covered in dog so we'll say covered in chaos, okay? Nobody wants to be covered in chaos. You jumped, but you jumped feet first into it this time. Got it everywhere. The bag was full, okay? So, but what if we'd had a plan? Not everybody keeps a fire extinguisher next to the door. Fire extinguisher would be a great plan. Um, what if you'd done the more managed, thoughtful response? The way this could have or should have gone. In reality, when you opened up the door and you looked down and you saw something that was on fire, yeah, your heart rate should go up a, a notch or two. But when you see that, you should be 
surveying the scene. Is this an emergency or not? Is the patient sick or not? Um, is this a load and go or not? Well, yes, there's a little bit of fire and we need to put it out because we don't want it catching the rest of the door or the house or anything on fire, but it's a brick house, so not worried about that. I'm gonna close the door back for a minute because I don't want that coming in the house. What do I have handy that I can use to put out a bag of chaos, flaming chaos at that? Oh, hey, let me have my drink for a second. All right. What was the alcohol cut? No, it was pretty low. All right, this is gonna work. All right, dump my drink. Good, bag is out. I'm not touching that right now. You go back, you make yourself another drink, settle back down on the sofa. You'll clean it up tomorrow. Um, movie night has been saved, okay? There was no emergency. Don't overreact, okay? You used a thoughtful and calm approach, but you did that because um, you applied a decision-making process. You applied previous experience to this. You'd had this happen once, maybe you'd had this happen once before. You'd already jumped feet first into a bag of chaos once before. You knew that this wasn't going to go well. So you pulled from that experience and did it. Or maybe you were trained by your parents. When this happens, do this. Um, you know, whatever the situation was, anything is better than jumping feet first into the thing. Okay. You thought about it. You thought about what the outcome could um, or should be, um, and you picked a response based off of um, those potential outcomes. Okay. It's so where scene management again. That's a it's a simple um, example of scene management, but it highlights that we should never walk away covered in chaos. Um, you know, I've heard people say it was messy, but we got it done. Well, yes, sometimes we just need to get it done. Um, and sometimes it, you know, how we get it done is going to be messy. Um, but it should not be messy because we didn't have any other, or, you know, when we had another choice. Um, if we have time to stop and think, um, or if there was a plan, um, did we use the plan? Um, then if the plan worked, then we shouldn't come out messy. Um, the outcome to the situation is ultimately the thing that we are looking for, but we should also be thinking about how we get to the outcome. The outcome is that we want the patient to survive. We want the, um, we want to save the house. Um, we want to save the, the dog from the lake, whatever the situation is. Um, but the how we get it done is important. It's not worth risking or unnecessarily risking a life to save a life. Um, it's not worth risking property to save a life. You know, be, you got to think about the how we're going to do this before you, you move forward with that. So, and then again, make sure that you don't walk away covered in chaos. Don't jump feet first into a scene that you don't understand, because when you do, you're going to walk away covered in chaos. Um, and, and we could talk for hours on examples of covered in chaos coming out of a scene that you um, didn't appropriately assess, you know, and covered in chaos could mean that you, uh, you know, your partner got injured, you got injured, your patient had a bad outcome, you ended up with paperwork, you, you, you lose your credential, your uh, agency ends up uh, in the media. All of these things um, are examples of covered in chaos. Okay. So again, just because, just because the patient survived doesn't mean that we necessarily did it the right way. Right, so. That gets us to triage, and uh, everything that we've done up to this point is about, you know, how are we assessing the scene? Um, how are we constantly paying attention to the world around us? Um, and that's on every call from, again, from one patient to a hundred, uh, any situation, these are, those are things that we're always thinking about. Um, now we're gonna talk about how to take those 
um, little nuggets and, and transition them into habits for success in triage. We've assessed the scene. We've realized there's multiple patients. They're both sick and not sick. We have a whole bunch of resources coming. Now, what do we need to do with them? Okay. Um, frequent, you know, too frequently we will look at things the other way of, oh, it's just the one patient, they're sick, but I've got plenty of resources. Okay, great. Well, in this instance, we're going to talk about you've got tons of patients, a um, bunch of them are sick, and you don't have enough resources. How do you manage the scene? So um, first, triage. Um, what does it mean? Um, to be thinking about this to yourself, um, and, and what is its purpose? Well, obviously triage is French, it means to sort. Um, and our purpose there is to do the greatest good for the most number of people. Um, typically in most EMS um, and fire systems, our, and, and healthcare systems, our job is to do everything we can to save the patient, the one patient. So think about a cardiac arrest. How many resources do we dump on a cardiac arrest in the field? A lot. Um, you know, where I came from, um, you got an ambulance and a supervisor, um, at least an engine, if not two engines, and a, or an engine and a ladder. Um, and depending on how long we were going to work the patient, we may get additional fire apparatus for people. Um, you know, the first place that I started, we were way out in, in the mountains, and their concept was the more paramedics, the better. Looking back on it, well, it was probably not the best concept. Um, so the EMS, EMS went, and the rescue squad went, which was also paramedic level, but volunteers, and then the fire department went, and it was as many people as we could cram on a scene. Uh, used a lot of resources for a single patient. Had very few survive, um, sadly. Um, now I think most of us have moved to a pit crew CPR approach where that's that's changed, but it's still it's very resource heavy. Um, we still need a lot of hands to do CPR. In an MCI, it's the complete opposite. It's how do I use the few resources that I have to take care of the most patients, um, and and how do I get those patients moving off the scene as quickly as possible. And we'll we'll talk through some strategies to to maximize that uh, efficiency and effectiveness today. Uh, what we don't often think about enough um, in uh, in discussions on triage is that this is meant to be a snapshot in time. And so when I'm when I'm doing this class in person with my EMT students, I give them a triage game to do where um, they they break up in teams and they've got a stack of about 30 uh, cards that have short patient descriptions on them. And I ask them to sort them out real quick. Uh, and you know, the first time before describing an algorithm or anything, they get really hung up on some of these things about you know, how they would take care of them and um, you know, what the long-term outcome of this patient is gonna be. Remember, triage isn't about the long-term outcome. Triage is about the snapshot in time that you see in front of you right now. It's about that, especially, you know, the, the tagging of red, yellow, green when you first get there. It's about that initial snapshot in time of just figuring out the piles of patients that you have so that you can get an assessment of the resources that you need um, and an idea of how many patients you have of what type. Um, Triage is supposed to be an iterative process where you get an initial triage, then you get a secondary triage, then you get transport. You know, we often forget that the secondary part, and we a lot of times we get hung up on thinking that as soon as I tag this person green, you know, I've committed them to not getting care. That's not the case. You've divided them up so that you can make an initial assessment of the scene to figure out. How big of a response do you need? So remember, 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 triage, the, the triage concept that we think of, of tagging patients, that's initial triage and that's a snapshot in time, okay? And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we work through this. The other important concept that we have to think about is what is the definition of, a, of an MCI? 
Um, and I've, I've, I've had many discussions with uh, EMT students on this because they automatically flip to their book and they say, my textbook says the definition of an MCI is this. Well, that's great for your textbook. Um, and because and we had to start with somewhere, and, and yes, if you're taking an ASH registry test, it has something to do with 10 patients. Um, I don't know, I don't remember stuff like that. Um, an MCI uh, is about having one more patient, then you have the resources and capability to successfully manage at your um, traditional standard of care. If your traditional standard of care is that one patient gets a stretcher um, and a paramedic and an EMT uh, on an ambulance to drive them to the hospital, so a lot of folks are moving away from, from dual patients in an ambulance, um, but you have two patients on the scene and one ambulance, that could be an MCI for you. Um, obviously, we have the crew members there to take care of those two patients, but when it comes to transporting the hospital, in that moment in time, you're going to be overwhelmed for a few minutes. It's important for you to know your jurisdiction's uh, definition of a mass casualty incident and what that means. Um, and it, it really is jurisdictional. Uh, I've worked in everything from rural EMS to urban EMS. Um, and, and it, you know, in every one of those instances, it changed. A uh, small community that only has two 24-hour-a-day uh, ambulances, um, if they get more than two calls in a row, they're in trouble. Um, so if they have one bus wreck that has 10 people on it, that's an MCI for them because they've got to figure out how to transport all of those patients, especially if they all need stretcher transport um, and, uh, you know, more than BLS care. At the same time, though, in an urban setting, um, that same bus wreck with the same uh, number of patients, just in a, a, a different location, um, for medic, that would not have been uh, an MCI because they had the resources immediately available to uh, transport all of those patients without any delay in their care. So again, MCI definition is fluid and it's based off of what your jurisdiction has the capability of handling. Um, the general rule of thumb though is an MCI is one more patient than you have the ability to care for using your normal standard of care. Okay. You might hear that again somewhere else. The other thing that I'll, I'll mention here today is we are not going to talk about types of triage today. This is not a class on um, the algorithm that you use to decide whether a patient is green, yellow, or red. Um, there are some really good uh, opportunities for that training out there, and there are some really good types, and I don't want to teach you um, something that goes against what your agency does in terms of your protocol for triage. So we aren't going to touch um, SALT or start or jump start or, or any of those. Um, we are, we're going to talk about green, yellow, red and, and walking wounded, but I'm, we won't talk about how you get to those different colors today. That's a, that's a totally different lecture. Okay. Got another poll. Um, when was the first time you experienced a triage, wow, situation, triage situation? Um, was it in school? first year on the job, after your first year, or you've never um, been in an MCI. About 30 seconds in, about 66% of the votes, keep them streaming in. I was really excited. The, the answer that I was hoping was gonna pop up was really uh, trending toward the lead there for a minute. Um, now we're, looks like we're slowing down a little bit. We're at 75%, there we go, close enough. All right, so um, number one answer was 40% said that, it, that their first MCI was during 
uh, their first year on the job. That's good. Um, your first year on the job is critically important for setting up um, how your skills develop over time. Um, we all know that in school you learn just enough to be dangerous and then we have to learn everything else in the field. Uh, coming in second was uh, in school, which is great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, and then the, uh, the following was uh, after my first year and disappointingly, um, you, for you from an experience perspective, great for your community, um, is that 17% of you have never um, been on an MCI before. Um, and so there are things that I hope you carry with you today that make your first MCI experience um, more successful than it probably would have. Because um, for most folks, your first MCI uh, is an absolute um, chaos show. You swap out chaos for your word of choice. Um, they uh, can, and, and for some folks, can be career changers um, if they've never experienced anything like that before. I was excited to see that, you know, in second place was school. I was hoping school would come in first place um, as we drive toward um, this experiential learning concept in most uh, EMS programs um, from a training perspective now. And I say that because uh, the, the, the program that I come from in, in Charlotte, uh, Central Piedmont Community College, absolutely love the, the way we were doing things there. We held, um, we would typically every um, semester um, have two or three uh, Con Ed EMT classes going, um, a curriculum EMT class going, a, and a paramedic program going, and once a semester, um, and each one of those classes lasts a semester, the end of every semester, right before we get to their scope of practice, we brought all those students together, about 75 students together, and put them through an, an MCI exercise using live patients, bringing in fire department resources. We used the, uh, the airport's uh, airplane simulator, lit it on fire, and we, we made them go all the way through the process from initially setting up, responding to the call, setting up incident command, triaging the patients, moving the patients to secondary triage, treating and evaluating the patients uh, in the, the treatment area, putting them in the back of the ambulance, um, and moving them to the hospital, um, caring for the patient, and then transferring care to the, uh, to the waiting physician. And radios, the whole night, they had to go through the whole process um, and in real time. Um, if, you know, if it meant moving a person, then they had to have a stretcher to move the person. Um, putting in the, in the ambulance literally meant putting them in the ambulance and riding with them for five minutes in the back of the ambulance. So, um, and we did, we did that in a, in a series of steps. So they all had their, they all came to the triage day. Before that, each class did their own session where we used MCI mannequins. We ran them through multiple different scenarios and multiple different um, settings where they got to tag patients, um, move patients, figure out you know, what is it like to be the person that's leading the fight, all of that stuff. They got this lecture on scene management um, because we knew that if we didn't do this for them in the school setting, then we would be looking at results like the poll of I either got it, you know, I, I either got it in my my first year and it was a great experience, or you know, I never I've never been to one and it's going to catch me by surprise one day. And that's the thing we've been trying to head off is we don't want um, the chaos of a situation like this to catch somebody by surprise. So if you have not been able to be involved in an MCI scenario, talk to your leadership, say, hey, I would like to figure out how I'm going to react during this situation. Um, or you know, I want to improve my skills. Um, is there an exercise coming up? Is there something that I can do with the community college or uh, the agency next door? Um, or, you know, hey, can we as an, an agency decide that we need to do a, um, an MCI exercise. I can tell you that 
um, every hospital that um, you transport to or have a relationship with has a requirement to do an MCI exercise um, yearly. And they have requirements to partner with the people in their community, um, the other agencies in their community yearly. So um, if you're near an airport, they have a requirement to do one every three years. So there's opportunities out there to participate in MCI exercises. Do yourself a favor, be proactive, go volunteer with your leadership to be involved in that. You'll walk away with a much better understanding um, of the chaos that comes in these situations and, and how to respond better to your first one or your next one. All right, let's see. All right, so we talked about this. When was your first uh, your first experience with triage and how did it go? Um, I don't remember my first experience with triage, um, but I do remember a very important one. Um, and been at this for, um, actually my paramedic um, expires at the end of this month. Um, and that will have put me at 24 years um, in EMS. Um, when I went to work for medic, I had been at this for about 16 years. Um, when I went to medic, I think that's right. When I went to medic, um, everybody starts as a rookie. Everybody goes through um, new employee orientation. Um, and onboarding, everybody gets a field training officer um, and everybody comes out, um, whether you're like me, a 16 year paramedic or like someone else in my class had never, had just finished school and never actually worked in the field before. Uh, everybody comes out as a non-crew chief and you spend um, a certain amount of time um, riding with someone else. Um, I spent, I only spent about um, a month and a half as a non-crew chief riding with someone else until uh, they moved me to a crew chief spot and lo and behold, also back, no, no, everybody already knew me as the disaster guy because I'd already spent time working um, with the healthcare coalition, teaching disaster education, doing all this stuff already. Um, they already knew this was the world that I lived in. Um, but I wanted to say that I had worked in an urban EMS system, you know, had a lot of friends that worked there. So I decided I would give it a shot. My first call on my first day as a crew chief was a three car MVA. Um, and when we pulled up, there were easily 15, 20 people running around. Couldn't tell how many of them were patients, how many of them were bystanders. I will tell you, um, as, as much as like you know, riding a bicycle EMS can be something, I forgot how to ride the bicycle that day. I lost control of the seat. It didn't go as well as I'm going to tell you. And this is part of the reason why I've turned this into a soapbox um, presentation. Um, is because I didn't do what I said you should do when you open that door and there's a flaming bag of chaos. And I didn't panic, but I also didn't think. Um, and I let, you know, it could not. And then, and I'll also tell you, for those of you that haven't um, been on an MCI before, there are just some times when no matter what you try to do, that scene is just isn't going to be managed. Um, there are sometimes that horse is not going to let you ride it. Uh, so um, be prepared for that situation as well um, and, and start thinking about what you can control. And that's what I ended up with was, all right, I can't, I can't keep these people separated. So I'm just gonna start focusing on what I can control. I know that these five people are injured. So we're going to focus on taking care of these five people. Um, and once I'm comfortable with how we're taking care of those people, I'm going to, you know, we'll start branching out and see if we can you know, reinvestigate who was in what car. Um, turns out there was just a whole lot of bystanders and we couldn't keep them off the scene. They kept trying to be helpful. They weren't being helpful. 
Um, and of course, we were the first ones there. And, it, and once we got some additional resources there, it was easier to kind of push things out. But the first five, 10 minutes, it was chaos. Um, a bunking bro bronco level of chaos. And I, you know, in, initially it got the best of us. And, you know, the patients that needed care um, more acutely didn't get it from us because we got distracted. So again, it, it happens to the best of us, um, but it can be prevented. Um, and now, if I were to run up on that scene again, I know what my strategies would be for, for preventing that. Um, so, but you know, if we have some time at the end, I, I'll, I'll talk you through some of those. So let's let's talk about some tips and tricks. Um, and for today, the focus is going to be on you being the first unit on scene, you and your partner, um, and making sure that you have habits that um, they're not going to be full foolproof. Um, you know, I have these habits. Obviously, I got fooled, um, but uh, I was able to stop and think and redirect my approach back toward my habits. Um, and again, there's a scene management component to this. Again, you can't triage a scene if you can't manage a scene. Um, and that all starts with, again, making sure someone's leading the fight. So who is the one person um, that is leading without doing patient care? Uh, and I know that this is a hard concept for some folks. Um, during that, that time when I was the non-crew chief, um, during, um, you know, uh, just come off of my, my FTO time, the person that was my crew chief, bless his heart, and if you're from the South, you understand the connotation of bless his heart, um, was a first year paramedic, um, had just finished his first year and just become a crew chief, um, and nobody had ever had this discussion with him. Um, and we were first on scene of a three car uh, collision um, in, a, in a tight space. So we knew that our help was only coming from behind us um, and they were delayed because of traffic. And he and I had a conversation before we jumped out of the truck. Uh, so I, I tried to do some mentoring with him. Um, said, hey, I'll grab the triage bag and I'll go tag patients. Um, and come back and tell you what, or, or go count patients and come back and tell you what we've got. Okay, so I did my thing. I went, made a loop of the scene, got a general understanding of how many patients there were and um, just a quick sick or not sick. Uh, how many do I think we're gonna have to board that type of Literally took me less than, less than a minute to loop the entire scene and come back to the truck. I get back, he's nowhere to be found. So I start my loop again and find him in the back seat of the first vehicle holding C-spine on the driver. He's my, for the scene, paramedic. He, you know, I'm a paramedic, but he's the one in charge. He's now committed himself to patient care and he can't let go. So now there's no, being the one in charge of the scene, now there's nobody in charge of the scene because he doesn't fully understand the details of the scene. That was by, by far not the sickest patient, is not the one where I needed him. Um, so, uh, you know, I end up stepping up, taking control of the scene, giving the scene size up, um, requesting more units, going through the process that we're getting ready to go through, because now he's stuck back there holding C-spine on a patient, because we didn't have anybody to turn that over to. Um, so make sure, um, one of the things you take away from this process is, um, don't, if you're the person leading the fight, do your absolute best not to get involved in patient care, at least initially. As other folks get there, supervisors get there, whatever, and, and you need to be, your, your uh, focus needs to be shifted, then by all means, jump into um, to patient care. One of the ways I do that, um, is in these instances, when I pull up, I don't put gloves on because that forces me to slow down. So if I don't have gloves on, I'm not going to touch the patient. Um, 
And, you know, I have to write on a notebook instead of write on my gloves, but, you know, it, it's a mental reminder for me that I'm not going hands-on with patients. Because then my job now is to start thinking about the other things, you know, maintaining awareness of the scene. Where is my partner? Where's the rest of my crew? What are the details of the scene? Can I describe in as few words as possible what I, over the radio, what I see in front of me? Um, because again, at some point I'm going to have to give a scene size up. Am I in traffic? Have I, have I positioned the unit in a way that's going to protect me from traffic? Um, or, you know, do I, do I need to keep an eye on my partner to make sure that when they step back out of that car, that they're not stepping back out into traffic? Also, you know, do I know where my help is coming from? Because I need to be able to assist them in parking in a place that's beneficial to the scene and to their ability to depart later. So if I've got multiple acute patients and I need them to do a load and go on some way, I, I don't need them um, parking in a way that, that they're not going to get back out. Um, and again, have you given a scene size of Now that you know the details, what are you telling people? Um, Medic 4 CMED on scene of a three vehicle MVC, uh, initial assessment tells me that I have six patients, two of them are critical. Um, I'm going to need fire department for both manpower and traffic control as soon as you can get them here. Um, any help that's coming from southbound, if you can get them off the interstate and have them go around and come back um, and, and meet us on the northbound side, that would expedite their ability to leave. Um, I don't have any hazardous materials, and so far I think I'm going to be fine with four transport units. Uh, if I have anything else, I'll let you know. Short, sweet, get it done. Let them know what you have and what you need. Okay. But the biggest piece is don't step in the chaos. You know, my my crew chief partner. Um, in that, that last example, he jumped feet first into the chaos when he jumped in and got in the back of the car and started holding C-spot because um, he, he immediately got tunnel vision, was totally focused on the one patient, had no idea that there were two patients sicker than that because he didn't wait for me to come back and tell him. Um, but the other piece as, as the leader of that scene, don't think that you can remember all of this. Take notes. If you don't carry you don't carry a notebook in your pocket, you should. Best practice, okay, whether it's a notebook, pair of sticky notes, whatever it is, don't use your phone. Carry a notebook. Um, okay. Take notes. Also, most of us drive around a big white dry erase board. Your agency leadership doesn't want to hear me tell you this, um, but if you drive a big white ambulance, you're driving a dry erase board. Okay, take notes on the ambulance if you need to. Um, draw the scene out. Make the situation around you work for you. Um, but also remember, the scene needs leadership. The people that are arriving need leadership. Freelancing is bad. It doesn't help anybody. So be ready um, to give assignments. Um, my favorite is to give assignments before folks arrive so they know when they put the ambulance or the fire truck or the police car in park. They know what their job is. They're, they come out mentally prepared to do the next thing. Um, and that comes with, you know, your, your ability to communicate with your communication center, your dispatch center, and knowing who you have coming to you and in what order. Um, so that you can tell them, be prepared, you know, park here, park this way, approach from this direction and park this way. Manage your scene, um, prevent it from evolving into further, further chaos. Okay. Medic 5, when you arrive, go ahead and grab your stretcher um, and the backboard. Um, you can leave the rest of the equipment. I'm going to give you a patient from the yellow SUV. I need you to take them and leave. Okay. Um, medic six, when you arrive, um, 
grab your stretcher and your equipment. I'm going to use you to set up a treatment area. Um, I'm standing at the intersection. I'll show you where I want the treatment area. Medic 7, when you arrive, well, there are four more ambulances coming behind you from the same direction. Um, you're going to see a parking lot on your right. I want you to pull in there um, and set up a staging area for me, and I will um, start reaching out to you to get the next ambulance in line when it's time to triage. You control the chaos. Um, and just by presenting that level of control, over the radio before folks get there, you're automatically setting up a calmer scene. Um, and also, the how you say that over the radio is important. Um, if I hear you yelling at me over the radio as I approach, um, I'm beginning to wonder if you really are in control of that scene. If you're speaking in calm, specific, slow verbiage, um, if you sound like you're in control, I'm going to feel more comfortable when I arrive that, that you know what's going on. So again, think about how you sound on the radio, both for your coworkers that are coming, also for your, your folks around you, um, both public and um, members of, of, of the team around you. Present yourself in a calm, controlled manner, and they will work in a calm, controlled manner and support you in a calm, controlled manner. Lose your crap, and the thing's going to fall apart. Okay. Um, also, just a quick plug, make sure that you know what you have access to. Um, if if you have a triage bag in the truck, do you know where it is? It should be in the cab with you. It shouldn't be in the back. Um, do you know what's in it? Do you know how to read and use the triage cards or the triage tags that are in it? Um, have you pulled them out and used them lately? Does your partner know? Um, do you and your partner have a plan for what you're going to do when you pull up to the scene of a triage situation? Do you know what kind of stuff to ask for? When the supervisor pulls up, do you know what kind of resources they have on their vehicle or when the MCI truck pulls up or the rescue truck? Do you know do they have a board that you can ride on? Um, do they, you know, are there, do we need vests? Um, if, if we're gonna need triage tarps and flags, where would those come from? Whose vehicle do those come on? Um, do you know if your system has access to those? And if so, when do they show up? Um, so just know about your equipment and how to get access to it. So this gets us to process. Um, and again, this is another, another. the whole rest of this is, is so that we don't, we, we always talk about triage in what's the algorithm? You know, are they walking or not? You know, respiratory rate, perfusion, mental status. We talk about it, but we never actually talk about the process for the scene um, and, and what order you do things. So um, this is my general process. Obviously, we do the scene size up to figure out what's going on. Um, if possible, before we get out of the truck, we get on the loudspeaker and say, hey, if you can walk and you can hear the sound of my voice, come toward the ambulance and stand right here. And I give them very specific treatment. That's move, assess, sort, send. That's mass triage. Um, if you can hear me, if you can see me, come over here, stand here. That's your, those are your green patients until proven otherwise. Okay, You just did your initial triage. Okay, Everybody else is probably going to be yellow or red. Okay. But the other thing that um, I find very important to do um, is long before we actually start triaging, for somebody needs to take a lap around the scene just to get a good mental image of what's happening. How many patients are there? How many vehicles really are there? Can you see every vehicle involved? Um, and, and, and come back and report that to the person in charge and tell them, I have X number of patients. Okay, good, because we only have three ambulances on the way already. Or I have X number of patients. Oh, that's bad because we only have three ambulances coming. I'm going to need three more. That helps you give your scene size up and, and make your request. From that point, you can decide or you set up the process for, okay, let's go triage. 
then we need to move the patients that we've triaged um, either to ambulances or to um, treatment and stabilization areas. If we're waiting on addition, additional transport, you know, we've got to make sure we've set up a process to start stabilizing and reassessing those patients because you know, once we get the move, we got to treat them at some point. Um, then we work on tracking and transporting the patients. And we'll talk about each of these steps in the coming slides. So the, the rest of this is a little bit scenario driven. So you have, uh, you've been dispatched to this scene. Um, it's a, a T intersection. Uh, you were dispatched to a multi-vehicle uh, collision, uh, unknown number of patients, um, several vehicles overturned. You're the first person to arrive. Um, and when you pull up, um, this is what you this is what you see. How do you set yourself up for success is what I want you to start thinking. Um, coming to assist you, you have uh, two fire trucks and one other ambulance already, and you're the first one to arrive over here to the right. So the first thing you want to do is, uh, is assess your scene. Um, from what you see, you find a school bus, and it is on its side. There's a car pinned under a dump truck. Um, there are two other vehicles involved, um, but you don't see any sign of fire or hazmat or any other dangers. There's no power poles down, um, nothing smoking, but uh, traffic is stopped in all directions. Um, and we're in a rural area. Um, about 30 minutes from the hospital. So it's time for you to make some informed decisions. Um, and again, you can't make informed decisions without information. So this is where, this is the point in which I say, go take a lap around the scene. Have your partner scout the scene. Um, for you, I want you to establish a command point. And we'll talk about the command point on the next slide. Um, and be prepared to, again, communicate calmly um, about what you need, um, about what you know, um, and what you found. Okay, so uh, here your partner uh, has gotten out and they're going to make a lap around the scene and they're gonna start counting, uh -oh. um, they're gonna start counting uh, patients um, by vehicle. While they're doing that, um, you tell them, um, I'm going to be standing right here at the front left corner, um, driver's front left driver's corner of the ambulance, and I will not move. Um, why do we do that? That gives them a place to find you when they come back and they're ready to report. And folks will say, oh, I've got a radio. Well, yes, you have a radio, but everybody else is going to be talking on the radio, and it's going to be loud, and it gets confusing back and forth come find me and report back directly um, so that we understand each other. Okay. The reason, the other reason why I, I pick a single location is I pick some place where I can see most of what's going on. And in this particular instance, I can see most of the scene. Um, I can see um, the, the approach roads um, to the north and to the east. Um, and I, I have an idea of what's going on. But more, the most importantly is there is one particular spot where, I, where my partner knows that if they can't get me on the radio, they can come here and find me. Um, it also gives me an easy location to be able to tell on incoming resources, of come find me here. Okay. When your partner comes back, they give you this initial count. They tell you that there's 19 on the bus. Several of them are um, probably really badly injured. The red car has two patients, but they appear to be okay. The blue car has two patients um, that are both sick. Uh, the dump truck has one patient. He's okay. It's just going to be a little bit difficult to get him out. Um, and the van has two patients that are both critical. Okay. So right now we're looking at probably two, four, um, I think we said eight, um, what we think may be priority patients. You know that there's your ambulance and another ambulance coming. So obviously you're gonna to need to ask for more resources. Um, you know there's two fire trucks coming. That's not gonna be enough hands to help you manage this. You're gonna need additional resources. So that's what you would make, how, part of how you 
make your informed request. That also helps you figure out um, what we need to do to divide up the scene. Okay. Again, as people arrive, you need to have a plan for how you're going to use them. Um, and uh, that also includes some geographic boundaries um, to help reduce duplication of effort. So you know that engine one was coming from behind you. Um, engine two was coming from, or sorry, engine one was coming from the west. Engine two was coming from the east behind you. Um, engine one um, is going to is, is going to be approaching the scene from the side where the patients are mostly. So let's have them do triage. So you're, you tell them on the way, um, start triage once you pulled up. That there are four man crews. You want to have two of them in the eastbound lane, two of them in the westbound lane, because we have. A, a probably half of our a little over half of our patients are in the the westbound lane half of our patients are in the eastbound lane um, and, th and that that keeps them divided up that gives them a specific place to work okay um, engine two when you arrive i want you to set up a triage location find me at the front of the ambulance and i'll show you where i want that set up um, ems2 when you arrive um, pull up near the ambulance and park um, pull off your equipment uh, and come find me at the front of my ambulance. Uh, I'm going to tag, uh, tag you with um, engine two to be my treatment unit um, once that gets set up. So I've given the, everybody jobs. Um, the, the, two, uh, the, the, the two fire department teams are out here going vehicle by vehicle, tagging patients. Um, and reporting back. I've told them that I want them to report back um, at each, after you finish each car, tell me how many people you have in that car and what their levels of priority are. Because <coughs> now I'm standing at the ambulance, either drawing on the ambulance or, or taking notes. I'm going car by car because I need to know um, where, the, where are my red patients? Um, you know, where are they by vehicle? Because those are the folks that I need to make sure that I get care to first. Um, or I get them moved first so I can get them to the hospital first. Okay. Um, again, managing the resources. I've got engine port one again, report findings by vehicle. Um, now that engine two has the tarps set up, I want them to be ready to, uh, to move any red patients um, as soon as they're found by engine one. Um, and then if there's any folks that are walking wounded, you know, they'll escort them. So basically the way this works out is, at, you know, engine one, um, he's up and says, hey, I've got two uh, possibly red patients in the orange van. Um, we need to get them moved to um, the red treatment area as soon as possible. So engine two sends two people, they grab a person, they move them. They go back, they grab another person, they move them. I've got an EMS crew member waiting um, at the red tarp to receive them um, so they can start caring for those folks. At the same time, keying up on uh, the radio to let uh, the dispatch center know, hey, this is what I've got. Here's, um, here's an update on the number of patients I have. Again, reiterating the number of, of resources that I need, but also based off of where the hospital is and, and the, the congestion on the scene, I'm really going to need to make sure that all the, the EMS units are routed around to First Street and they come south on First Street. And we'll call, we'll call this right here, the North and South Street, First Street. They need to come south on First Street um, for best access to the scene and best departure to the hospital. Okay, but again, all of this stuff, you know, there's nothing that says that, that it's gonna be this cookie cutter or this scripted. Um, And then, but but if you can think about how this might look for a scene, it gives you the opportunity to start scripting it based off the scene you see in front of you. This may not work for every scene. Um, this can't be cookie cutter. Otherwise, we'd have a different way of teaching it, and we wouldn't have to teach this this way. Um, but you need to think about what's going to work best for you and your scene in this particular instance. Um, and that also includes how you. Um, manage these treatment areas down here. 
Um, too often I've seen um, folks come up and they just start dumping patients on the tarps. There's nobody there on, at the tarp to receive them. Um, and then we don't remember who was the, the, the most sick of the sick. Um, so um, I, I prevent freelancing um, by using this staging, you know, staging for the ambulances before they get there. And then we call for state, call for resources from staging, come get this patient and leave. Um, but also, you know, making sure that somebody is in charge of each tarp to keep the tarp calm. Um, that way people aren't dumping a patient on the tarp and then running away to go get another patient and come back. You come, you give me a brief description of the patient, I tell you where to put them and then remind you, okay, put them side by side um, because this one down here on the, on the, the very far right, that's the sickest of the sick. And as soon as I get a free ambulance, that's the first one that's going. This one um, is a little bit sicker than the last one. So put them second. Okay. My job as the person taking care of that tarp is to make sure I know how sick each person on my tarp is. And then in the downtime, try to provide some care to them. Um, as the scene, um, as the, the, the person in charge of the scene doing this lets me see um, without getting involved in patient care, I know that I've got three red, um, three yellow, and a handful of greens, okay? Um, and I can get a number of greens if I needed to, but I can see from first to last, you know, how many, how many patients I have, and it looks controlled. Um, this also sets up, up for a process for assigning a patient, then verifying the patient, and then assigning the patient to the hospital. So this ambulance pulls up, they pull up, they stop, they get out, they come see me. Um, I tell them which patient to take. They go to the TARP, they get that patient. Um, they come back, they've got to come back by me. So I verify that they got the right patient and I verify who they are, you know, what, what unit it is, and tell them which hospital they're going to. Um, so now I have tracking for my patients. They get in, they leave, next ambulance pulls up, we repeat the process, okay? All right. So now that it's getting this complicated, we're starting to get into um, I, in the incident command system and, and ICS. So it always breeds the question of who's in command. And that's up to you and your jurisdiction um, and, and how that works. You know, could be fire, could be law, could be EMS. More than likely, it should be unified command because everybody has a role to play in this. Um, unified command is how we operate on a daily basis. Um, this next couple slides, we're going to talk about how medical operations fall into the overall incident operation um, with a key focus on understanding span of control. Um, and that's, that's the key concept of ICS that transfers to the calls that we run every day. Uh, um, all of a sudden, there are more people or resources or patients than I myself can manage, and I need more help to manage those patients. Optimal span of control, three to, or three to five for some things, five to seven for others. Um, general rule of thumb, think five people. The most I can supervise is five people. Um, ICS, especially in this instance, is not about paperwork, so we're not going to talk at all about filling out forms or paperwork. In this instance, in, a, in an MCI, uh, ICS is there to help with span of control and, and job responsibilities. So medical branch, components of the medical branch usually have a branch director. This is not medical command. Don't say medical command. There's either command for the scene or there's the medical branch director. Um, there's unified command or there's the medical branch director. Um, underneath the, the medical branch director, we have triage. Um, they're responsible for the initial triage and, and movement of team of, of the patients using triage teams. There's a treatment group supervisor. That's the person that, or the, the folks that are at those red, yellow, and green tarps that are there to do secondary triage and stabilization. You have a staging officer, a staging supervisor, and a transport officer or supervisor, depending on how you label them. So what does that look like on an org chart? Well, here we, we should all be familiar with this. Um, Unified command, or it could be operations um, at this point. Um, it's obvious at the top, we've got to have safety in there, make sure that we're doing things safely. 
Um, the medical branch um, is a co-equal branch of the fire and rescue and law enforcement branches under operations. And then under the medical branch, we have triage, treatment, transport, and staging. That further divides under triage and treat more, treatment. Um, we may have this, you know, depending on how many teams you have out there actually tagging patients. Um, and then you've got your red, yellow, and green treatment areas. No, there is not a black or blue treatment area because more often, you know, most jurisdictions, the rule of thumb is if they're deceased, you leave them where they are. We'll deal with them after if that's part of the crime scene investigation. So this is what it looks like on organizational chart. But again, we want you to walk away today knowing how this works in real life. So really this, when you think about how this is stretched out across a scene, this is more of how it would look like on the scene. So you remember before how I was standing here at the front of my ambulance, um, if, as the person in charge, um, I've become the medical branch director. A couple supervisors have showed up. They're now over here in unified command or operations, depending on how our big our um, structure is. They're off from the scene, back away from things, um, in a parking lot, not immediately hands-on. Um, I've moved myself to the sidewalk here to be out of the way um, so that I could see, and my transport officer has taken up this position here on the corner. Um, Staging officer is back down the road a little bit to this parking lot and they're holding ambulances and other resources off the scene um, until um, ops and command call for them or until I call for them, depending on how we want to address that communication. My triage supervisor, the one that's responsible for each of the teams out there doing triage or for moving the patients, has set themselves up over here so that they have a better view of the scene and we're communicating um, I can see them, um, and then we're also communicating by radio. My transport officer is here, so that as, as ambulances come down, they have to pass by the transport officer um, to get their um, destination, do patient tracking. Uh, and then my triage officer, my triage supervisor is standing back here so that they can watch all three of the tents. And if I have enough people, there's a person um, responsible for each one of these tarps. So again, it looks nice and neat and orderly uh, spread out on the organizational chart. There is no, um, the, the structure is not the same when we get to the scene. So, um, but think about where you're setting yourself up so that your uh, position makes sense in what you're supposed to be doing and who you're supposed to be communicating with. So bumping right up on time, um, so what did we learn today? Um, we learned that scene management is a skill that is required for every scene, no matter what. Um, situational awareness improves decision-making and outcomes, and we want better outcomes. Never, ever, 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 if at all possible to be avoided, get covered in chaos, okay? Um, remember, scenes won't organize themselves. Um, and not all scenes can be organized. So um, be prepared to control what you can control. Triage is more than just deciding what priority someone is. Triage um, involves that whole process of being able to count, um, divide up your scene, tag people, move people, treat people, and track and transport people. Um, and then span of control can make or break your success um, and is really the driving point that moves you from standard scene management to needing to do incident command. You know, by the time it gets this complicated, uh, one person will have a hard time managing all the moving pieces and parts of this successfully. So don't be afraid to delegate um, and work within your span of control. With that. Questions? I'll turn it back over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Travis, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone else, for tuning in. We would love to continue this conversation with you. So please visit us at careercert.com to watch a recording of this webinar or to access other free resources. Thank you guys so much for connecting with us today, and thank you for all you do to make our communities safer places. Take care.